Hello, I'm Matthew Hood, Vice President of Government Relations at Dartmouth Health. Government Relations is so pleased to roll out the 2022 We Care, We Vote initiative. We Care, We Vote is a nonpartisan voter education initiative designed to encourage participation in the 2022 midterms. We do this by providing information on registering to vote and voting in New Hampshire and Vermont. You can find these resources on the Dartmouth Health website under Health Policy. As a 501c3 organization, Dartmouth Health does not engage in election intervention activities, meaning we don't tell people whom to vote for, but we do invite all candidates for discussions so that we can learn where they stand on issues and have an opportunity to ask questions. I want to thank you for your engagement and remind you to vote on November 8th. Hi, I'm Joanne Conroy, President and CEO of Dartmouth Health, and I want to welcome all of our viewers to our latest session of We Care, We Vote Health Policy Grand Rounds. With me today is Senator Maggie Hassan, incumbent candidate for the U.S. Senate representing New Hampshire. Senator Hassan was elected to that position in 2016. She serves on a number of really important committees for us, including Senate Health, Education, Labor and Pensions, and Senate Finance. Prior to her service in DC, she served as New Hampshire governor for two terms, that is for four years. And prior to that, she served as state senator, first selected in 2004. Welcome, Senator Hassan. Thanks so much for having me, Dr. Conroy. It's great to be with you. You've been representing us since 2016. Can you tell a little bit about your DC experience? I think all of us read how difficult that is for an elected leader and why, in spite of all that, you're seeking re-election. Well, I thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you and all the viewers in the community at Dartmouth Health uh, today. Look, every day, Granite Staters put aside their differences and they work together and they get things done. And that's really the example I've worked to follow in the United States Senate. And working across the aisle, I have been able to help us do a number of really important things from expanding high-speed internet uh, to every community in the state, to fixing our roads and bridges and boosting manufacturing and making sure our veterans get the support and the care that they need um, and they have earned and deserve. I've also stood up to big oil and big pharma to take the necessary steps to begin helping lower people's costs. I have a record of getting results, and I'm proud that I've been recognized as the most bipartisan senator in the country because I think it reflects the approach I work to take in this role. Um, I always start with kind of just trying to listen to Granite Staters about what matters to them the most, and a couple of things that um, have really um, kind of focused me is Communications from Granite Staters about things like surprise medical bills. Uh, I teamed up with a colleague on the other side of the aisle uh, to take patients out of the middle of disputes between providers and insurance companies uh, over billing. And I've also worked to uh, significantly increase by 900 percent uh, direct funding to New Hampshire to help us uh, fight the opioid epidemic. So these are things I've been able to accomplish. I'm running for re-election because I want to continue the work of bringing people together across party lines and getting things done uh, and listening to Granite Staters about what matters to them the most. And I hope very much to earn their votes. You know, Senator Hassan, you've actually done so much. It's hard to believe it was a little over three years ago that we had the first case in New England up here. And, um, you know, it's interesting, your, your region spans some of the largest cities in New Hampshire to some of the most rural areas, and increase in broadband access is kind of a critical part of delivering care and to some of the most remote areas in our state. Um, so we really appreciate the support you provided hospitals and our communities to kind of get through COVID. And I'm not sure we're through yet, but I think many of us can see the impact of the research as well as the federal funding that has helped us really shore up our health system. What do you think the next step is in aiding the fiscal recovery of hospitals? Because I think most of us feel like we're not out of the woods yet. Right. Well, first of all, I just want to thank 
Dartmouth Health, um, but really healthcare workers everywhere for everything they did and continue to do uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I know that it was particularly stressful uh, during the time before we had vaccines uh, to be on the front lines, often short-staffed uh, without all the equipment folks needed, and really working to give first-class care to patients who were very, very sick and very, very scared. And I just can't tell you what a difference you have made for patients and their families, uh, the way you always do for patients facing incredible healthcare challenges, but particularly during COVID. I agree with you. We're, I think we're in a different stage of the pandemic, thanks to scientists and clinicians uh, who got us vaccines in record time, thanks to the partnership we all had in terms of distributing vaccines and making sure we were doing the kind of outreach uh, that got got them to every community uh, in the state. Um, and I'm also really uh, grateful to partner with you all in particular in serving our rural communities and those telehealth efforts that we made uh, and the investments in broadband, but also getting sure, making sure our patients had actual equipment that allowed them to access telehealth was really important. Um, moving forward, uh, I wanna continue to hear from Dartmouth Health and other healthcare providers in our rural places in particular about the particular needs you have because uh, your costs are different. Your challenges with workforce are somewhat different. Um, we have begun to do some work to invest in training up critical healthcare uh, staff, but we know there's a lot more work to do. And then we know there's a workforce shortage generally um, that's impacted by a lot of different things, uh, including housing, and we need to work on that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Workforce shortages are always a little bit more difficult in rural areas. Uh, and it's because some of the other constraints in our rural communities. I know that you have been really focused on identifying some of the housing constraints, the childcare limitations, staffing shortages across all industries. It's not just healthcare, but we feel it, I think, most profoundly in healthcare. We were probably experiencing some of these before 2020. Um, but the pandemic has only exacerbated them. How do you think about um, support for expanding and um, actually training up the workforce? Could you talk that, about that in a little bit more detail? Yeah, sure. So one of the things that I have worked on both first as governor now in the United States Senate is trying to create um, workforce training pathways that meet people where they are. So if you are uh, somebody, let's say, who's uh, working in a non-clinical job at a hospital, uh, maybe you're part of the uh, housekeeping staff and you want to train up to become uh, LNA, for instance, uh, we need to find a way that you can work and earn your living, but also get that training that you need in a place and at a time that works for you in your life. So these career pathways that we have begun to put together uh, in partnership between, for instance, employers and community college systems in New Hampshire need to be scaled up and expanded. And that's one of the things we've worked to do in several pieces of legislation that have passed. The Chips and Science Act provides for some workforce training. Um, the rescue plan specifically invested in workforce training in the healthcare fields and particularly mental health care fields. Um, but that's the type of um, kind of flexible training pathways we need to expand on. I've also worked with Senator Collins from Maine uh, to make sure that we are focused in rural communities on making sure students are getting the training that they need to align with employers in their rural areas. So uh, for Dartmouth, uh, obviously, healthcare training would be a, a very um, aligned skill set that we want to make sure students in high school uh, have access to early on so that they know they can stay in their communities and work. So those are some of the things that we have been focused on. White Mountain Community College, for instance, uh, up in the North Country has received a grant that's allowing them to really focus on skill sets that are needed in that part of the state. Uh, and that's the type of work we need to continue to do and expand on. And I'd look forward to partnering with you on that. In addition to focusing on our um, younger evolving workforce. We also actually have one of the oldest populations in the country, probably the second oldest, but 
um, I think we're increasing in popularity as a place for people to retire. And of course, they rely on Medicare as their source of health insurance. Um, you know, I have a 98-year-old mom who <laughs> has actually relied on Medicare for a long, long time. Um, however, they've identified that the trust fund will be unable to fulfill its commitments starting in 2028. You know, I think when they actually developed the whole concept of Medicare, you know, the average lifespan was actually much more, shorter than it is right now. Um, CMS has proposed annual Medicare payment rates that don't probably keep pace with medical inflation. So understanding these two kind of um, the tension between these two conflicting needs, um, how do we ensure that Medicare is available and seniors will be able to access the medical care that they need? Well, thanks for the question. And um, something that you and I have in common is mothers who are uh, living into their 90s. My mom just turned 91. Um, and so, look, there are a couple of really important things we've already done. Um, and I think the thing I would point to is the legislation that we just passed and the president signed into law uh, at the end of the summer, which allows Medicare to negotiate the cost of prescription drugs. Uh, that is going to save the Medicare program hundreds of billions of dollars over the next 10 to 20 years. It saves the program money, helping to shore up its solvency. It also addresses um, the federal deficit too. Uh, and I continue to work uh, to take other steps to make sure that we're lowering the cost of prescription drugs and biosimilars um, by bringing um, generics and biosimilars onto the market more quickly in a way that obviously still protects the health and safety of our patient population. This is an area of major difference, by the way, between me and my opponent in this race. Uh, my opponent has said that he would uh, focus on privatizing Medicare and cutting trillions of dollars from the program. And obviously, that would be devastating to seniors uh, and devastating to the ongoing success of the program. Uh, for both Medicare and Social Security, uh, growing the economy is critical so that people have higher paying jobs, are paying more into the system, um, while we also work, again, to lower things like the cost of prescription drugs, invest in more home and community-based care, which can also help us save money. And that's why I'm the sponsor of something called the Better Care, Better Jobs Act, uh, so that we can expand our home and community-based care system and support a workforce in that system that uh, would allow the workforce to sustain families. Um, and so those are some of the initial um, thoughts I have about what, you know, what we need to do and what we have done. Um, for people who are watching this and wonder when they're going to see the impact of the step we took on Medicare negotiating prescription drug prices, um, I want them to know that seniors starting in January will have their insulin, if it's covered by Medicare, capped at $35 a month. That's a major step forward in controlling costs for seniors and controlling costs, obviously, for the Medicare program. We will also see a ripple effect um, across the prescription drug market because um, as Medicare begins this negotiation process, I think uh, what experts tell us is we should see um, pharmaceutical companies uh, reluctant to increase uh, their prices um, at a rate that would draw Medicare's attention. So um, these are important steps forward. And again, a major uh, difference between me and my opponent. We need to make sure that Medicare will be there for the long term. Yeah, that's really great news for a lot of our diabetics. A couple of years ago, we actually made our insulin and our test strips free for all of our employees and wow. really saw a huge improvement in compliance yeah. in terms of their um glucose management. And you sure. know, that's ultimately going to help in outcomes. Yeah. yeah. So let's pivot a little bit to research. We are an academic medical center, right. the most rural one in the country. Yep. Um, and there's a lot of incredible research that comes out of here. I like to remind people that we actually, at the Geisel School of Medicine, developed the pathway for stabilizing the spike protein that allowed both Pfizer and Moderna to actually create the vaccine. Yeah which really emphasizes the importance of um, basic science and translational research to actually improve um, medications and interventions for the public. Um, we have been the recipients of a lot of federally supported research um, from the NIH, from the um, 
Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the Centers for Disease Control, and certainly the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. What are your thoughts about ensuring that there's really robust federal funding and infrastructure to allow these innovations to improve care? Well, I think this is one of the areas where there's really uh, strong bipartisan support uh, for investment in the kind of basic and translational research that you're talking about. Uh, I will just take a step back uh, for those viewers who don't know. Um, my husband, Tom, and I have two adult children. Our oldest, Ben, is 34 and lives with very severe cerebral palsy. Uh, we have seen uh, over the course of his lifetime the importance of the kind of research, uh, whether it is basic clinical research, translational, or even applied research uh, that has made a really big difference in the quality of his life and the quality of our family's life too. So I am a strong believer in um, robust investment in all of the areas that you just talked about, doctor. Um, I am committed to doing that because I just know uh, how game-changing it is, not only for individuals, but for our communities generally. And the difference, uh, the research can make and obviously has made when you talk about the research behind the vaccine. The fact that that vaccine was developed so quickly really speaks to the importance of laying the groundwork with basic clinical research. So um, I have consistently supported very strong budgets for um, agencies like NIH. Uh, I continue to look forward to talking with all of you about ways we can strengthen these um, the funding and also the partnerships we have. I'd be remiss too if I didn't talk about the important work that Dartmouth has done around the opioid crisis and understanding substance use disorder and the work we still need to do there to train people up in that critical specialty. Senator Hassan, I'd like to um, kind of pivot back to workforce and mm -hmm. talk about women in the workforce. So 85% of um, most of our employees are women. And yet we know that 30% of the people that left the workforce have not returned. And there are a number of issues that drive that. Um, and I'm sure it's a topic of conversation in DC as well. There are things that maybe other countries have done to support women in the workforce that we have actually not stepped into that space. And I think there are a number of drivers. Can you just talk generally about kind of how you would actually support um, moving more women back into the workforce? Uh, well, it is a really pressing need, and you are right. When you look at the data about who was employed before the pandemic and who is now back in the workforce, uh, one of the really um, startling differences is that more women um, are still out of the workforce. And a lot of people, as they're doing this research around uh, the reasons behind this are pointing to the lack of affordable child care. We know that affordable quality child care was already uh, hard to find in New Hampshire and frankly, in a lot of the rest of the country um, before the pandemic. And then the pandemic happened um, and it really uh, undermined uh, whatever um, fragile system we had. So there is ongoing work in Washington. We're looking in the Senate at how we can invest critical federal dollars in robust, high quality uh, child care, making sure that the child care workforce is paid well enough uh, to provide quality care, but also uh, to plan a career um, around early childhood education and child care. Uh, and there are a number of different mechanisms uh, we have considered about doing that, for instance, capping the amount of family pays for child care at a certain percentage of their income. Um, and so, we continue to focus on how to expand the child care system. Uh, I continue to support significant more investments in uh, Head Start, which is such an important part of the child care and early childhood education system. Um, one of the other things I supported in the rescue plan and hope to have the opportunity to make permanent is the expansion of the child tax credit so that working, you know, that families get this refundable 
predictable tax credit uh, that allows them uh, to afford better housing or child care um, and put food on the table and making sure that their children don't live in poverty. Um, that's another kind of direct way of just helping people with the overall cost there. So those are some of the initiatives that we are focused on. Uh, it's also really important that we uh, catch up with the rest of the world and finally have paid family leave, um, which would be another major way of supporting women in the workforce. You are talking about a lot of the social drivers of um, people's quality of life, but also we know that that translates to their health. And yeah. we had done a study and compared the um, lifespan of people that live in Claremont with a lifespan of the average individual that looks lives in Hanover. And it's 15 years difference in probably less than 20 miles. Yeah. And so social drivers of actually health are very important. You've talked about child care. You've talked about the impact of poverty. Um, what are the other social drivers that are high on your radar screen to address? Uh, well, we, we do know about the impact of poverty on overall health. Uh, and I, it's my understanding that poverty is now considered um, an adverse childhood experience um, in the ACEs framework. One of the other things we need to do is um, learn more about um, adverse childhood experiences, how to prevent them, uh, how to address them when they happen. Um, and that really requires an uh, integrated uh, approach by a number of different stakeholders. We need to be investing in um, behavioral and mental health services, not only at our community health center centers and helping primary doctors uh, understand uh, how to provide uh, this critical primary care, uh, but we also know that our schools and our teachers uh, need to have some of the basic tools around uh, behavioral and mental health, um, first aid, if you will, um, spotting issues, uh, and then having the kind of support systems uh, with enough mental health professionals uh, to really uh, help our children as they um, navigate life, hopefully with very few adverse childhood experiences. But obviously, this is an area where we know we can make a difference if we address it early on. Um, and it really does speak to our need to focus on preventing poverty, but also having the kind of primary and community-based healthcare system where people can get access uh, to um, to healthcare, uh, whether it's mental health care, behavioral, uh, or whether uh, it's um, what most people think of more traditionally, I guess, as, as primary care or physical uh, health care. Yeah. So, Senator Hassan, we've kept you for almost a half an hour. Is there anything else that you would want our viewers to know about um, your commitment and your activities um, in D.C. Yeah. should you be really uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. As I said at the top, I so appreciate Dartmouth Health and the entire community uh, that is Dartmouth Health um, and the difference it makes in our state and frankly in our country as we just talked about the research and other efforts that you all have been uh, engaged into. I hope what people will take from this conversation is my commitment to listening to Granite Staters, addressing the priorities that you all identify for me, whether it is uh, the need for childcare or housing, uh, the real uh, work of lowering people's costs right now. People are very concerned about energy costs in particular. And I want people to know that uh, we have, um, I, I led a bipartisan push to dramatically increase the amount of home heating assistance that will be available this winter and continue to push the administration to release more home heating fuel so that uh, people will have access to lower cost uh, home heating uh, this winter. Uh, we've taken steps also uh, to cut taxes for people who invest in energy efficiency in their homes. I know these concerns are top of mind for people. Uh, we are addressing short-term costs like energy and prescription meds, as I've talked about. Uh, we also are working to address the long-term drivers of inflation with things like the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill and the Chips and Science Act, which will help lower costs as we pull supply chains and manufacturing back to the United States. 
Um, if I'm lucky enough to serve again as your senator, I just want people to know that I'll always listen to you. I'll focus on the things that matter to you and work on delivering them in Granite State fashion across party lines. Thanks. Thank you so much, Senator Hassan. And I want to remind all of our viewers to vote November 8th. Thank you Thanks. again. Thank you.